just keep ignoring things and pretending like it's not happening. The same goes for an organization as goes for your body. I'm not saying it's easy. These decisions are actually quite difficult and made more difficult depending on where you live in the world and what your work culture is like and the food that's available to you and the list goes on and on. So if you have literally five minutes, do some sort of movement. If it's yoga, if it's a stretch and flex, if it's a quick walk, I don't care what it is, but it's better than not doing something at all. So it's like, let's really focus in on simple things. Hello and welcome to the Mind Your Leadership podcast. I'm Karen Zook, and today I have the honor to speak with Kelly Keltkamp. Kelly is the founder of Prevention Plus, an on-site injury prevention company that is changing the way companies take care of their manual labor or craft employees. Kelly has a master's degree in exercise and wellness, and she is the creator of the Move Better program used by thousands of job site athletes over the last 20 years. Kelly has a passion for helping employees reduce their discomfort and increase their well-being. In this episode, we'll be speaking about the powerful connection between movement, awareness, and leadership. We'll explore how physical presence and body awareness can enhance a leader's ability to stay grounded, recognize stress, and respond proactively in high environment risks. So Kelly, thank you for joining. Thank you so much for, for having me. I'm really excited to speak with you today. Me too. So I love to start with a personal question and ask you, what was the highest or lowest point of your life or career path? And what have you learned from it that you can share with us? The thing I always, I mean, we talk about it all the time I, it, in general when we talk about leadership and business and anything, and it always seems to be that a failure or something that went wrong ends up leading to something that goes well. And that was exactly my experience. I was in a company working with people in an environment similar to now. So I was also working in an industrial setting where I was trying to help prevent strains and sprains and injuries for manual laborers. And at that time, the company wasn't doing very well. And I was in a meeting with somebody who said, okay, well, we have to cut your pay. We have to go, go through all these changes. And I sat there thinking, well, I'm not getting paid very much right now. How can I continue? What can I do? And so with my, I felt my back against the wall. I said, okay, well, I'm done with this company. I can't. But then I'm like, but I think I can do this by myself. And so it was my opportunity to become my own boss and start my own company. And that's what happened over tw almost 20 years ago now. And so though it was lowest where I was like, well, how am I going to make my life work right now? Uh -huh. it, it opened up that opportunity to say, hey, you know what? Even though you're 20 something years old and you don't know all the things, this could be the option. And, and it, it, it worked, luckily, <laughs> with highs and lows along the way as well, but certainly. <laughs> it's a journey, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I love it to so say every setback, it's also an opportunity. And actually, you took this uh, setback in order to navigate your life to the place that you wanted. Because my next question was, to share the story behind Prevention Plus, but actually you shared it right now, pretty right? Much it. Yeah, it's pretty much it. It, it. it has expanded, obviously, since then. And it, the one other thing that's a high and low that I thought of is when the housing crisis occurred. I was working in industrial settings like construction, but also warehousing. But when the housing crisis happened in like eight, 2008, 2009, construction was like, Phew. and so I had to pivot. And so I pivoted to not industrial settings, more in offices. So corporate settings, law firms, trading firms. Well, then COVID hit. So right. I pivoted again because <laughs> I couldn't work in offices anymore. And then I got back into construction, which is actually my, my passion, my love. And so I was very happy that that happened. So even though it was like a very big disappointment to have to move from the clients that we were working with then and shift, it's been beautiful. So again, I was you know, you go from, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And you're like, oh, I can shift again. So just staying open and available to, to things that come at you and how you respond to it. <laughs> this is actually being present and mindful, right? Listening to really what the environment needs from you, the employees there, the situation and being able to pivot and change. It's really crucial. So can you tell us a little bit, what are you doing with your company in different... Uh... Yeah, so basically... 
when you look at, and again, this is all for manual therapy. So anything from you're talking logistics to warehousing to cold storage, anything where there's a lot of people doing a lot of physical activity, that some will become less important as we continue to use technology. But there's mm-hmm. always going to be a manual component to almost all of these jobs. So how do I better prepare the person that is going to do the job to do it well without getting injured? For me and working passionately with these groups, I want to make sure that they have a life outside of work, that they can enjoy the activities or participating with things with their kids, that they can do those things. So that's most important for me. When I look at when I'm trying to you know, talk to the client, that's also an important thing for them. Sure, they want to take care of their people, but also they want to save money. And so by avoiding these injuries and keeping people working more efficiently, you get a person who's more present, working more efficiently, and also you're avoiding those injuries, those costs, the replacement of someone who's been hurt and can no longer work, insurance, et cetera. So we do that through a couple of different ways. One, we're doing, have you ever heard of stretch and flex? This is an interesting one. It's no, a stretch and flex. Code, I understand. What is it? But yeah. can you explain? It's a, it's a program that industrial settings use to prepare their workers for the work that they're going to be doing. And it's Mm -hmm. been around for about 20 years. The research goes back and shows that it's been there. And it shows that it's positive. It has a positive effect. But there's something that was missing. And it was the the research showed that static stretching or holding a stretch was the way to, to get people ready. That's not the way you get people ready for work. You get people ready for work through dynamic movement. So we've Mm -hmm. kind of reorganized the stretch and flex and created a dynamic warm up for people to do before work after breaks, after lunch, to get, again, their bodies prepared for work. So that's the number one way we come in and we we get to get in front of everybody and start to express how important it is for movement and preparing for the work that they have to do, even though they've been doing it for, I don't know, 10 years, 15 years, whatever. They're like, I know what I'm doing. Great. Let's get you ready for it, even though you already know, your body already knows what to do. Mm-hmm. So that's the first part. And then we are lucky enough to be able to get hands-on, one-on-one time with employees their teams, their job site athletes. So we have 15 minute sessions where we do assessment. We do time where we're doing movement therapy. We do time where we're doing manual therapy. So like massage type techniques, physical therapy type techniques. And then we're also doing exercises, breathing, general health advice for individuals that are so busy working that even if the information is there in front of them, maybe they're not taking it in. Or I just have to get through the day. So I'm going to have three energy drinks and don't understand the negative consequence of that. So we can come in and start to explain there's other options. There's other things you can do for yourself that are cheap and easy if you start to implement them them into your day. Like this exercise, try this or this. Make sure you're getting enough water or make sure that when, if you can, you're shutting that phone off earlier before bed to get that rest and recovery that your body needs from the physical work that you're doing. So it's just things like that. We are, we are so blessed to be able to get in there and work one-on-one with these folks. And so that's our main goal as a company. That's our like flagship part of our program. The stretch and flex is just a bonus. We get to get in front of everybody and then also just consulting in general for companies. Interesting. When you talked, a few things resonated within me. First of all, actually you helping them to increase their awareness about their body, right? About why they shouldn't drink like 10 coffee a day and <laughs> take themselves out to nature to have a 10 minutes trip outside of the office in order to breathe the fresh air, to listen to yes. the birds and take a, a little breath. First of all, you're increasing their awareness. The second thing, you talked about working with warehouses and the people on the manufacturing industry, but at the end of the day, you know, in the high-tech sector, the people most of the day are sitting in front of the computer. I think it's also really crucial for them to move the body, to stand. You, know, you see, I see a lot of people standing and walking in, in, instead of sitting all day long because mm-hmm. it's not good anymore. So I think it's also going to the technology, uh, high-tech companies, not yeah. only to the manufacturing. And, the, and I, the last thing that I came to my mind, I wanted to ask a question, so, you know, today is also yoga uh, lessons that we bring to the people, the employees, in order to stretch the body, to be yeah. present. And you talked about it a little bit. So what's the difference between these techniques and the yoga, between the stretch and the, uh, how do you call it? The stretch, stretch and, and flex is what it's, and it's flex yeah, stretch and flex. Yeah. the yoga. So there's a lot of questions yeah. I throw through. Yeah. Well, 
I'll answer the first the first one. I'll answer this last one first and say okay. the difference between yoga and stretch and flex would be this. Yoga is often it's a it's a set amount or set type of movements, right? And in those movements, it's breathe and move further, breathe and move further, breathe and move further or hold. Usually those kind of cues and those are what you want people to do with them. Most often what I find about the yoga positions, though I think yoga is amazing, is that they're a little too aggressive for what, how the bodies move when I see them move in those settings. Okay. So what I, what I try to do is I take movements that are bending forward, ex moving backwards, rotating side to side. So you're twisting, you're doing all those moves. You take them from small to big, but you're almost always doing a movement through it. We do a little bit of holding, but a holding would be like for a couple of seconds, like three seconds at the end of a stretch to the side or something like that. We have to, I want to reach, our team wants to reach everybody. We want to make sure everyone feels good when they're doing that. I will argue, I don't think everyone does all the time because sometimes someone's going to have something going on with their shoulders. So if they reach up, that's not going to feel great. So what I try to do is I try to get the, all of the movements done in the short window of time we have with them in the most dynamic and, and controlled way so that it's not, okay, you got into that position and now hold it. And now breathe and now breathe. No, I want you to get in and out of it because you're going to have to get in and out of it throughout the day. So how do I get you prepared for that? So the difference is yoga usually holds more. There's usually a longer hold and the movements are big and aggressive. So I, the movements here with the stretch and flex that we do are much, almost much smaller, even though we're getting into all of the positions, we're not staying there for as long. So I'd say that's the difference. So I think yoga is great. Um, I just, they do yoga sometimes on construction job sites. And my fear is, it's so aggressive. And I'm like, a, I'm a safety like, oh, okay, well, let's not hurt anybody. Because even though you can do that motion, five or 10 other people can't do that motion. But guess what? They're going to try. <laughs> <laughs> and then you might really be in trouble. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing when it comes to sitting at a desk versus working out in the field, I 100% agree with you beyond, I can't even tell you how much. And it's funny because each of our clients that we work with, we there's always people that are working behind the desk to get the business done. So we always get a chance to work with those folks as well. And that's amazing too. Messaging changes a little bit because when I'm working with my job site athlete, I'm saying, hey, you move all the time. Let's be thoughtful of how you move, okay? So you don't need to go after work and walk, you know, for 30 minutes. You don't need to because you've walked literally all day long. You can, if it feels good, go for it, but you don't have to. The person who sits at their desk, I really do want them walking. So I'm saying even... If you can get 10 minutes of walking in um, three times throughout the day, take a phone call while you're walking, if that's possible. Yes, stand at your desk. Beautiful idea. Although I will say this, when you find yourself leaning on the desk or doing this, then just sit down. And then after about 15, 20, 30 minutes, then stand back up again. If you have that access to up and down, because if then people go from sitting all day to standing all day, there can be some issues with that too. But movement is our friend posture is amazing and we're all sitting here like this. So I end up talking about posture with everybody and trying to create an opportunity where people can be wide their, through their shoulders and tall through their neck instead of getting this shoulder forward. And people wonder why their backs hurt all the time. Mm -hmm. It's that stress of this forward. So people sitting at a desk, people moving all day long, either way, movement is actually the key still. It's just proper movement. It's important. So from your experience, how does physical movement contribute to leaders' self-awareness and presence, especially when working with high-stakes environments and also not with high-stakes? Yeah. Either way, when you – we do so much to make sure, I think, as leaders, especially of large companies where there's lots of stress involved, so much has to get done. And even if you're really great at delegating, there's your, your plate is very full. If we do not – take into account how much our body actually plays into that, I, we're making a large mistake because inevitably what's going to end up happening, and maybe it doesn't happen at the moment, there's going to be some discomfort or pain that comes from not taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And we're really good at ignoring it up until we can no longer ignore it, meaning something really aggressive happens. And that's what we're trying to avoid, me in general. So if I can make someone understand that, listen to the signals that your body is telling you, it's saying move, so move a little bit. But 
if you don't take care of that, you cannot take care of all of the people in your world. And that's family and or your business. So making sure, yes, you take, you make sure you have your meetings with your folks. You make sure you're doing all the research that you need to do. You're making, getting sure all the emails are out, but make sure you do something movement wise for your body every single day. Otherwise it's going to come up whether you want it to or not. So, you know, actually there's a saying goes that our body, it's like the rental vehicle in this life. You know, it comes, it, it claims to serve us, right? So we need mm-hmm. to take care of it. Like when you put fuel in your car, you also need to put the right fuel in your body to really listen to your body because it's part of us and helps us navigate and be present in this life. So I think it's, as I see it, it's really connect to being present and mindful because as you said, you usually ignore and are not tuning in. We're listening outside of ourselves to mm-hmm. everybody, to all the noises we're in, uh, in a wandering mind instead of really listening to what our body needs. And if I really feel tired and I won't listen to it and I will ignore it, at the end of the day, I will burn, burn out, right? So I, I won't be able to continue. So if I will be really uh, mindful of myself, of my body and what it tells, it tells me, I can walk with it and say, okay, I'm really, that's right, I have a lot of work to do. I need to, I'm, but I'm exhausted. So I can, how can I navigate it? Maybe I can mm-hmm. delegate some of my stuff to my employees or to postpone it to next week. And to prioritize in, in accordance to my abilities, because I think this is one of the mistakes that people are not listening to themselves. At the end of the day, life will stop them, right? The body mm-hmm. won't continue anymore. Yeah. The body usually ends up winning in some way or another. If you're going to ignore this little like twinge you have in your neck for weeks and weeks, all of a sudden you're not going to be able to turn turn your head, right? And then you have to, then you have to pay attention. So it's like, mm-hmm. If I, that's a big thing. If, if I could just um, make people be be in their, be present in their body from time to time in a day. And the way that I usually say it is like, it's, there's the, there's the quote, move it or lose it. If you've heard that before, I'm not sure. But if you don't move your body in all of the ways that your body can move, you will lose the opportun- option to be able to do that. And so I'm always saying to people, especially people that sit at desks, if you can reach up tall every day, if you can touch the ground every day, like literally even lie down on the ground every single day and get up these things and reaching side to side, then you'll be able to. What do you want to be able to do when you're in your 80s and 90s? Honestly, that's like, I think the first question. And I want to be able to walk up the stairs with groceries in my hand. I want to be able to pick up grandkids or, you know, walk still, take care of myself. If we can barely do it now, which is unfortunately, a truly sad fact. I mean, I look at people in their 40s now and I'm like, what are you going to do when you're 80? Right. And it's because I'm focused. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I don't have time for that. You have time. You have time. If you don't take the time now, if you don't move it now, you're going to lose it. You're not going to have the time later. So and it's never too late to start, Mm -hmm. but you have a better effect if you start in your 30s and your 40s and your 50s than you do when you're in your 70s, 80s, and 90s. So how do you handle this uh, resistance of, of managers and employees that you come to work with them and they tell you, we don't have time for this. It's like, you know, it's like, reminds me like meditation. It looks like something that I don't have time now to pause for 10 minutes. I need to walk, but right. it's counterintuitive because when we pause and we really listen to the tiredness within my body, it can transform and move and then I can come fresh from this meditation and be much more productive but people don't connect the dots sometimes and say okay I don't have time for it but so how do you handle this resistance how do you engage them Mm -hmm. good question yeah no it's a great question and it's something is a daily challenge right and so I am I guess I'm lucky enough to be able to be one-on-one with people even if I'm just let's just say I get to a job site and I'm just walking in the door and I see someone, I'm like, hey, and I'll just start talking to them because even that moment where I can say, I know you can't come in to see me today. That's okay. How are you feeling? What's going on with you? How is your drive in to work today? And so I get that benefit and it's not every day, but if I can kind of get my, and I joke, but I try not to be too aggressive because I'm happy in the morning and I'm happy in the afternoon. And sometimes people are like, but if I can if the moment of their day can be highest when they start thinking about themselves, like, and they say, oh, yep, actually feeling okay, or actually my shoulder's a little bit irritated, and quickly I can give an exercise or something like that and say, hey, 
good thing you focused on it. Let's let me give you something or stop by the the you know the office that we're in before you leave the day and we can give you something. But I get the one-on-one time. Once I get someone to admit to me something's like going on with them and I can give them a very small, easy little fix on it. And I don't have all the answers. I'm not going to say that. But oftentimes these are like it's low hanging fruit, if you will. Like it's a really simple thing. Oh, you didn't realize that you stand or you sit like this all day long. Guess what? Your low back's going to hurt. But if you did this every once in a while, you would feel better. So getting people to move opposite, very simple stuff. And it changes their world. It changes how they feel. So once I get that, and then if that person is leads a group, a small group, then that person would be like, you got to go. You got to go. So then it just kind of filters through the the organization. So it takes time, but that's how I do it. One-on-one, one-on-one. <laughs> right on, getting into them. No, I think what you said, we can offer it to our listeners, actually finding this uh, micro mindful moments and being aware to, of their body, right? Really mm-hmm. inviting them. You know, I think people don't, I think we all know that we don't like change, right? We want to be in our comfort zone and not move and it connects yes. to my yes. body. So I want tag him to the gym. I don't want to be aware of it because I don't have time for it. And now I need to start focusing on my body, doing yoga, et cetera. So I think um, inviting people with baby steps, like starting with small things, be aware in the morning when you wake up, scan your body, see if something is aching, even mm-hmm. give you attention for what, like one or two minutes to this place, like breathing into this place can create change within your body. So it's really inviting our attention inside and finding this time during the day, even after lunch, close the door, take a few deep breaths, listen to your body, relax. Even if you're so very tired, let this tiredness exist Mm -hmm. and don't resist it. So I think this is the invitation for people to understand it and employees as managers to understand it it's part of the day and to find these small things that can uh, energize you, that can really help you to listen deeply to your body and increase your presence. And we know all that then we'll be much more productive and efficient and energized because at the end of the day, it's energy, right? So if our body is tired and we are not walking the right way or um, something is aching, it will decrease my energy. What do you think? I 100% I agree with that. It's if we ignore, again, the signs that are being told to us. Also, if we ignore as a manager, if you ignore what your team is telling you also, it's it's kind of the same. It's a good analogy because like you're like, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And then what's going to happen, you know, a couple weeks down the road or even a couple of days down the road, if you just keep ignoring things and pretending like it's not happening, the same goes for an organization as goes for your body. So again, taking better care of yourself. And that's, I'm not saying it's easy. These decisions are actually quite difficult and made more difficult depending on where you live in the world and what your work culture is like and the food that's available to you. And, you know, the list goes on and on. So making some of these decisions are not easy. But if you start to implement them into your day, whether it's like, hey, make sure before you have your cup of coffee, every time you're drinking a big glass of water, let's get hydrated, right? Making sure that I know your day is going to get nuts. So if you have literally five minutes, do some sort of movement. If it's yoga, if it's a stretch and flex, if it's a quick walk, I don't care what it is, but it's better than not doing something at all. So it's like, let's really focus in on simple things. Don't, don't give up because you can't go to the gym seven days a week. Oh my gosh. Like this is what, this is, these are conversations that I have with people that I, I have to step back and say, hold on. It doesn't have to be perfect. No one's perfect. Make small changes or do something good for yourself each day. And if it doesn't work out exactly as you had planned or wanted it to, you still did something. And it doesn't like negate the entire rest of the week or month or, you know, whatever. Because people who make that excuse really easily, especially in America, they're like, oh, you know, I've got to make my New Year's resolution. And I'm going to go to the gym every day. And then by Jan- end of January, you've missed a day. And then like, ah, pff, I'm done. <laughs> and the gyms are empty again by February. So it's like, you know, great for a person that goes to the gym regularly. I'm like, oh, I have my space again. But not great for the people that have gotten a goal started. Like, go simple, go small, give yourself some grace and allow yourself to live as a human. There's things that are going to go up and down 
but if you don't take care of the body that you have, it you don't you won't have it. You're gonna be if you don't take care of it, you're gonna be forced to take care of it, or you're gonna have to have other people take care of it in our lovely sick care system here. <laughs> yeah, it's in, it's interesting because to be honest, when I was in the beginning of the journey of my self awareness and connecting to myself, I was disconnected from my body. I came to the retreat and told my a teacher, why do I need to connect to my body? You know, but it's set on trauma. So I think it yeah. also a lot of people disconnected from the body based on traumatic experience, you know. So how do you deal with this? How do you deal with this space? Because I think it's a huge aspect in the ability it, to connect our body. It is so but huge. It, and it's one of those things which I'm what how I try to make person a person feel the safest because look. We have one-on-one -on -one sessions, which again, are the most beautiful opportunities to help people move better, help people feel better. And so, like I said, we do movement, but we also do manual therapy. So hands-on, like almost like massage type techniques. And so that's an interesting setting, right? Because when you talk about trauma or you talk about anything else, like, like, like that, that leads into the way the body moves and what you hold, what I try to say to anybody is, we don't have to do that manual therapy part. Everything we do here can be done through just movement or me showing you a different way of moving or taking a breath. Breath is fantastic. Now I'm working with construction workers and so breath sounds weird. So I don't usually say breath. We change the way we do things. It's more like, here's it. Here's what I want you to try to do is breathe in and I want you to feel it here. And I touch the ribs and I touch the back and I give them like little cues like that. But definitely over the years, been doing this for a long time. I've dealt with people and I don't know their trauma. I don't understand it and I don't need to. What I need to know is like right now for that person, me rubbing their shoulders is not going to be helpful. I have a small team, but the team of people that I'm working with, it's an important part of our learning environment. Like you need to know who you're working with. When you're in the group setting with Stretch and Flex, hey, we do what we do and we hopefully get 80% of the people to feel like great while they're moving. But when you're in that one-on-one, -on -one, the most important part is that they feel safe. Mm -hmm. That's number one. And that means like you talk to me for 15 minutes and I'm not a therapist and we're not doing mental health. But if something's going on in your body and you're feeling something like that doesn't feel great and you want to talk through it, great. Maybe by the end of the session, I say, oh, I see what's happening. You're doing this sort of movement all day long while you're drilling and you're moving to the right, moving to the right, moving to the right. Maybe you just need to start doing some rotations to the left in the middle of your day or throughout your day. So it's like, I can figure that out just from conversation. So we don't have to do that. And so you bring up a really important topic. It's not everybody. It's not even a lot of people that would even admit to like, I don't want to do that because, mm -hmm. but that's why I continually go back to people and say, could you give it a try? Do you want to give it a try? And this is what, what we can do. It's not going to work for everybody, but it's, it's definitely something where it's an important topic. Safety is most safety on a job site or in, in a warehouse is important, right? But safety, someone feeling safe with Provention Plus, absolutely number one. It's literally a top of like our training manual. Like you create a safe space. Safe space is important for every workplace, right? Do you see a connection between the leader's physical posture or movement pattern and their mental emotional state? Can you, from your experience? Yeah, I think everyone's different. I will say this, what I see mostly is someone who is less likely to take care of themselves is less likely to be accepting of a program like this. So we probably won't be there. If we are there, it's because someone else made the decision, right? And it might be a little bit more of a fight in this particular department. And I don't mean fight because I'm not fighting anybody, but it is the like, I'm in charge and you're my team. And I don't really think that prevention is a good deal. So you probably don't want to go. Not that they're saying it, right? That I think is the biggest thing that we encounter. And so I don't try to fight it. All I try to do is still have those conversations with that individual that I know doesn't dig what we're doing, doesn't think what we're doing is effective in any way. So again, just try to give little things, little things. Again, not like in a session, just like walking down the street when I'm talking to them kind of thing. Because <laughs> I am I may never win them over, but I'm certainly going to try. <laughs> From your experience, companies and organizations are open to this state of mind, to the importance of working with the body. Yeah, more and more they are. I think that's what's really neat about the over the last 20 years, what I've seen still, I absolutely will get people saying, now, what are you doing? 
what are you doing? Like you're you're working with these industrial athletes and you're you're massaging them and you're breathing with them. Again, it's all in the delivery of what I'm saying. So it's all about the injury prevention and about movement. And so, yes, there are a lot of places now that would never have thought of it before as an option. And a lot of the decision makers are saying, we need this. Look at our injury rates. Look at the cost of these injuries. Look at how our group of workers, our demographic of workers are getting older and older because people are not coming into the trades like they used to. We have a problem with that. What are we going to do if these people aren't taking care of themselves in their 30s and their 40s? They're never going to make it to their 60s. And they want to, and we want them to keep working because if they don't, we don't have that workforce anymore. So it is definitely becoming more important and accepted higher up. And I would also say, though, it is still that person who takes care of themselves as well that understands how important it is to start to share some of this information with the folks that are down in the field. And not to say that the men and women that are working in these jobs don't care about their bodies. They might, but they also might feel like they don't have the time, the money, right? I compare these folks often to athletes, right? So I'm saying you're an industrial athlete, you're a job site athlete. You get paid for your performance, just like anyone else on like on the field or the court does. And I realize you do not have the money, you do not have the time, you do not have the team of people to help you through these things that you're dealing with physically. But we're here for you, and I'm going to give you easy things you can do that are cheap and effective if you do them. So let's try that. That's that's how we attack it. But again, if it it's got to be top, it's got to be from the top. They've got to understand that yeah. it's important or think that it's important. Yes, it's need to be leading by example, right? Because if the leaders won't believe in it, it won't go into the culture of the company, and people will embrace it. Although I think, as you said, nowadays people are more aware of their body, of their diets, of their way of living. I think it's really getting big attention and, you know, it connects Sorry. to the well-being because well-being in the workplace is a crucial element nowadays and employees are looking uh, for programs of well-being and to be seen and to have uh, to get tools and uh, facilities in order to stay in shape and feel well and not only coming to work and going nine to five and going home, right? Yeah. And I think it's interesting that you've mentioned that because what, what companies have done over the years to try to draw people in. Like the, here's a benefit that you guys have as you work with, with, as you work with us, you get this opportunity. But I remember back, like, I got, I guess it's gotta be close to 20 years ago. You know, when, when the tech stuff really began and all these businesses were hiring all these employees and they're like, oh, food everywhere. All you could ever eat. Don't leave work, right? Here's your food. Here's all you need. And I'm telling you time after time of working within these groups or working with people that worked there. I started working, I gained 20 pounds. I started working, I gained 20 pounds because it's an ever present opportunity. We're talking more about wellness, but we still haven't really followed through on some of these things. And so for the person that's working in the office, I get it. Having lunches and having opportunities for people to come together is wonderful. You need that and want that in a community, especially as people are more and more coming back to an office setting. But what I'm worried about is like, ugh, your options there. Oh, don't worry. We don't have soda out all the time and we only have the little cans available, but still like we want to create a atmosphere of that wellness. So how can we do that in offices and more difficult, honestly, with more difficulty out in the industrial setting where people are even less conscious of the information that's coming out about mm -hmm. good choices. So it's a, it's a challenge every day, no matter who I'm talking to, no matter what setting I'm in. It's difficult. Yeah. <laughs> Kelly, before we need to wrap up, is there any question that I didn't ask you and you, you want to share with the listeners? The only thing I was, as I was speaking or thinking about all this and listening to podcasts for, from yours, I was thinking about leadership as a whole. I realized I've, the biggest mistake that I made with any leadership was I assumed, this was a little while back, that every person kind of thought the same way that I did. Mm -hmm. So I often hear like, don't micromanage, don't micromanage. That was my thing. So I was like, I am, I'm not going to get involved. I'm going to let this person, they're trained, they know what they're doing, I'm let them work. What I realized was after conversations and a few mistakes that happened with one particular employee was she was not like me at all. And she needed a lot more input. And so it was like, 
mind blowing. I was like, oh my gosh, because what I felt like I was doing was telling her too much and involving myself where I shouldn't. But I realized, at least in her journey where she was at, she needed much more input. And so that was kind of a wake up call for me because you can read all the books and you can do all the things. And But it was like, I need to get more information on each person that I actually do lead and be open and listen to actual response. So it's like actually listening, listening a lot more than I think I was prepared to a while back. <laughs> That's my big like takeaway from just leading in any way. Amazing. And it circles back to the beginning of our conversation about listening to our body, right? Listening to our body, to our environment, to our employees, and being open-minded and really walking with it, walking through it and not resisting it. And if I feel something in my body that doesn't feel well, instead of ignoring it at the, the end of the day, it will be a negative effect. So instead of pushing it back, listen to it and walk with it. And if something doesn't work for you, be with it and ponder with it. And maybe go to the gym or maybe go to a massage or maybe go to a therapist, whatever works for you, but find the right solution for you. As you said, you needed to find the right solution to each and every one of your employees. And at the same time, we need to find the right solution for ourselves so I can listen to different perspectives but listen to my body and what I need in this moment. And this is, I want to close with these tools because connecting to the body, it's really a crucial element that I use daily. Listening to myself, if I have a question and something doesn't, is not resolved for myself, I'm putting the question out there for myself and really listening what the environment brings me regarding the solution. And I really listen also to my body and see where it resonates in my body. If it doesn't work for me, I feel, you know, a, something aching in me or my belly is uh, yes. moving, right? Yes. But if something works for me, I like kind of have shivering in my body and say, okay, this is a good uh, path to go. So I learned to work with my body in order to get the answer. I think our body is, has a lot of wisdom. It does. And part of it is listening to it and learning to work with our body. And part of it is the movement aspect, right? Yeah moving our body and listening to what our body needs. Sometimes we need rest, sometimes we need nature, sometimes we need yeah. air, whatever, right? Stop, stop ignoring the signs that we're getting. Everything is so stimulating around us now and we are so focused and busy that those we're, we're getting signs all the time from our body, either to move or to breathe or to drink water or to go to the bathroom, <laughs> whatever it is. We're getting signs. We're like, nope, can't do it now. Nope, can't do it now. So be willing to listen and Separate yourself from those extra stimulating things from time to time. And usually that's computers and phones and things like that. We got to put those things down. And you don't have to meditate. You just have to put it down from time to time. Kelly, thank you very much. If people want to uh, approach you and bring you to their company, where can they find you? Yeah, I think LinkedIn, Prevention Plus, or Kelly Feldkamp is a great way to reach out. And um, we have an Instagram page as well at Prevention Plus. Um, so please just reach out. I always encourage and uh, appreciate questions. So if you have a question, even if it's like, gosh, I, every time I sit down on my desk, my neck hurts, honestly, send, send it to me. It, th those are things that we deal with every day. And it's just, it's, if you are feeling something like that and it's constant, it's so annoying and you cannot focus on what you're doing. So send over a message or if you have a question about how it would work in your company or with your company, I'm open to all those questions and love them because it's just, it's, this is a passion for me and I'm, I want to keep spreading the word. <laughs> so please reach out. Kelly, thank you very much for this inspiring conversation and all the tips that you gave us. Absolutely. You're so welcome. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed the conversation. You're invited to subscribe to our podcast in order to know when we upload a new episode and follow us on social media. Thank you for listening. Until next time, take care and bye-bye.